You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Professor Sarah Seeger. Sarah Seeger is a professor of planetary science, professor of physics, and professor of aeronautics and astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her past research is credited with laying the foundation for the field of exoplanet atmospheres, while her current research focuses on exoplanet atmospheres and the future search for signs of life by way of atmospheric biosignature gases. Professor Seeger is involved with a number of space-based exoplanet searches including the Deputy Science Director for the MIT-led NASA mission TESS and the Principal Investigator for the on-orbit JPL MIT CubeSat, Asteria, and as a lead for Starshade Rendezvous mission. Her PhD is from Harvard University and her BSc is from the University of Toronto. Among other accolades, Professor Seeger is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a 2013 MacArthur Fellow. Dr. Sarah Seeger, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, you work with one of the most interesting things in science, exoplanets, and specifically exoplanet atmospheres, which is probably about the most exciting thing I can think of is characterizing exoplanet atmospheres, which is something we're just now able to start doing. What do you think is the best way to start? I mean, should we look at these 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 large planets like Jupiter that, you know, these things that are so big that we can see them easily, but we probably already know generally what their atmospheric makeup is? Or should we go for the gusto and just start looking at rocky exoplanets and see what their atmospheres look like? Well, I can speak for myself and for a lot of people, we're most interested in the rocky planet atmospheres. But at the same time, we want to do everything to advance the whole field. Now, do you expect with, of course, exoplanet atmospheres, rocky exoplanet atmospheres, do you expect that it will be easy to see the signatures of life? No, actually. No, I don't expect it to be easy. And if we see any signatures that might be made by life, I think there'll be a lot of back and forth controversy discussion about whether we can attribute any given signal to life. Now, this is going on right now with Phosphine and Venus. That's right. It's a it's a, almost a perfect example for us to cast the future of exoplanets. Do you think that detection at Venus, I mean, phosphine would be hard to produce without life, essentially, my understanding anyway. Do you think that's a detection problem or do you think that there's something there? Are you talking about Venus now or? Yes, just just with the Venus detection. Did you look at the data and say, well, this might be, you know, it's some sort of observational issue or maybe it's there? Well, I'll stand by my team. We stand by the view that there is something there. And the wavelength where the absorption of happening is phosphine with possibly a small contribution from another gas that also overlaps sulfur dioxide. Really? Another one? Well, there's a lot. I don't want to our conversation to be all about Venus, but out of the issues that people are concerned about, one is, is the detection. You know, there's two issues. One is, is the signal real? And the second one is, if the signal is real, is it due to phosphine or is it due to some other gas? And so many people are saying there's no signal there. Some people are saying there's a signal there, but it's not phosphine, that instead it could be a gas called sulfur dioxide, which is known to exist in Venus, and that has uh, an overlapping spectral feature with phosphine. I see. So it's sort of the <laughs> the noise gets to be a problem, right? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'd quite put it that way, but in general, it's still playing out. Now, in regards to searching the rest of the universe, exoplanets themselves, Rocky exoplanets specifically, which obviously are interesting for features like liquid water and things like that. But with like, for example, a gas like phosphine, how difficult is it to detect at that kind of a distance, light years? Well, in general, it's not so much how difficult is phosphine to... Okay, so we to be a bit more specific, phosphine would have to be produced in vast quantities. So the signal that we're seeing on Venus, we would say that's about a part per billion of the atmosphere is phosphine. But we couldn't detect that tiny of an amount of phosphine on a planet orbiting a star far away. 
in that case, there'd have to be a much more phosphine. Like, I don't know if the number means anything to you, but say hundreds of parts per million or even more. What is something like oxygen, which obviously is a biogenic gas here? And I mean, it could be geologic as well, or, you know, some other, other reason, but it still seems to be a good indicator. But we have a lot of oxygen as opposed to something like phosphine. We do. We do. We have a lot of oxygen. Our atmosphere is filled with 20% by volume oxygen. That's a lot. We'd love to find oxygen on, on a rocky planet far away. It would be a huge, 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 huge discovery. Now, the James Webb Space Telescope, it's not unfortunately designed for visible wavelengths where oxygen has its strongest feature. So it's kind of, you might call that like an accident of history or just something that the gas we most want to see. The James Webb Space Telescope does have instruments and detectors that go to that wavelength, but they're not ideal. They're very noisy, noisy there. And as you pointed out, oxygen can be made other ways as well. And so I think if we see a signal of oxygen, I can just imagine it playing out like phosphine on Venus. There's a lot of noise in the data. It's a very, very hard signal to extract. Is the signal there? If it's there, is it oxygen? If it's oxygen, is it made by life or not? So I think it gives you a kind of flavor of what to look out for. What if you see a profile of gases like oxygen and methane? Do you step closer to being able to say that's probably a biosphere producing that? We do. We'd step closer if we see two gases that shouldn't be present in each other's company. And that would be a big, a big thing. Now, I don't I want to manage expectations because it's so hard to see, observe small rocky exoplanet atmospheres and you know, there's a bit of a debate about how well will the James Webb Space Telescope really be able to do. And another little tidbit for you is that on Earth, oxygen and methane were never together in high enough quantities that we could detect with any kind of telescope we're going to have in the, near, in the near future. I'm not trying to make it, I know I sound very negative about all this. I'm just trying to sprinkle a dose of reality. It's going to be hard. <laughs> it's going to be hard. But now you've worked on something, a starshade. At this idea of creating a way to block out a star's light in order to see in a very specific way the uh, be able to observe exoplanets. Could you give us an overview of that? Yes. Starshade is a giant, specially shaped screen. It would be tens of meters in diameter, and it would have its own spacecraft, and it would fly in outer space above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere, and it would work together with a space telescope. And these would be two separate things. And the starshade would block out the starlight. It would line up with the telescope and block out the starlight so that only planet light would enter the telescope. And these would have to be, starshade and telescope would have to be very precisely aligned. And the starshade would formation fly with that telescope at tens of thousands of kilometer distance. Now this almost looks, it literally looks like a, a flower of sorts, which is for diffraction, right? Right, right, right. Because it's not obvious at all. But, you know, people like to ask, well, why can't you have a giant circle and put it really close to the telescope? And then it could be a much smaller circle than tens of meters. It would just have to match the telescope aperture size. But it turns out that diffracted light is, is a killer. And the analogy I like to give, well, diffracted light is because light can act like a wave and it can bend around the edges of the screen. So thinking about blocking out a star, which is a point source of light, the light would bend around the screen so that in the image, uh, you wouldn't have blocked out the starlight. It's so counterintuitive, but you would see ripples, bright rings, concentric rings that would be brighter than the planet you're looking for. And the analogy I like to give is that it's like dropping a pebble in a pond where there's ripples, those waves. And the star shade is mathematically designed so that there won't be any ripples because the light will diffract around the these petal-like shapes and it will interact with itself so that the image is very, very dark. And the related analogy, which is it doesn't make any sense intuitively, is that it would be like dropping a pebble in a pond and the pond would be perfectly smooth, but all the ripples would be pushed away from the center. Can you imagine what that would be like if you dropped a pebble in a pond and it's so flat, but then away from it, there are ripples just start appearing all around. But that is the nature of light. That's right. Now, some of the other instruments that are going to be coming online, like the giant Magellan telescope and things like that, will those be able to um, sort of take up the slack for what James Webb is not equipped to do? Yes and no. Each of the new telescopes coming online can search for a slightly different type of planet or 
look at the atmosphere in a different way. And so what the giant telescopes coming online uh, with the right instrumentation is they'll be able to use a coronagraph, an internal device. It's like a star shade, but on the inside of a telescope. And they will be able to block out the starlight and see the planet directly for small stars, for M dwarf stars. And they can probably search about 100 such stars looking for planets. And if they find a planet that's in the so-called habitable zone of the host star, they'll be able to look at the atmosphere. But the atmosphere they'll be able to look at is in the infrared, because you know how on our planet Earth, our, you may not know this, but in the infrared, our sky is messy because the gases in our own Earth's atmosphere are emitting and absorbing. And we only have very specific windows of, of light, of wavelengths where we can see the night sky. So these giant ground-based telescopes can find planets in the habitable zone of their host star for small red dwarf host stars, and they can look at the atmospheres at very specific wavelengths. In specifically looking at exoplanets, now these are biosignatures. These these are, you know, I mean, Earth has been visible as an oxygen and methane bearing world for billions of years now. So you have a better chance of spotting long-term biospheres by looking for biosignatures. But what of technosignatures? What of alien civilizations? What would we look for in their atmospheres and say that there's a civilization there? Yeah, that's. I love that question. And with right now, with the telescopes that we just talked about, we can't detect any kind of technosignatures, at least that we have on Earth. When we think about Earth, we think about chlorofluorocarbons, you know, complicated molecules that may or may not, probably not exist without life making them, without intelligent life making them. Some people like to think about the sodium lamps in cities, artificial lighting, and even, which is getting now more and more fringe, is even giant structures that may have been built by intelligent life elsewhere to signal their presence. Which should be, <laughs> I think it was Luke Arnold, the French astronomer, that wrote a paper years ago about how <laughs> you could put louvers <laughs> passing in front of your star and see that with a spacecraft like Kepler, where you, you might actually see. And then, of course, there was that, that instance of KSE 8462852 that <laughs> sort of looked like that at first, obviously turned out to be dust. But these ideas of, you know, very advanced civilizations creating things that you could see very clearly from afar. But at the same time, does it seem likely to you that anyone out there would build such a thing? I mean, I could put the question back to you, you know, to you and the listeners. Do you think that's realistic? Well, I think um, I would say that I think it's realistic in, in the sense that if you give them enough time, they will put up enough trash to where you might actually start to see something that looks like a, a Dyson Swarm, as, as, it, as it were. But because we're already building one. I mean, we're abandoning spacecraft out in solar orbit. You know, as soon as they're done, they're done. And if we do that for another million years, you know, eventually <laughs> that might be visible. But as far as an actual astro engineering project, I don't know that we would ever need that much energy. Right, right. That would take a lot of energy. To purposely do it. To purposely do it. And I, I don't know that I would be, I, I don't know that I would expect that. But I also I have a sneaking suspicion that we live in a microbial universe where microbes are ubiquitous. Maybe they're everywhere underneath ice shell moons like Europa. And that intelligence, though, is very rare. You know, it just seems like you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. So I don't really expect to see a techno signature or at least an active one you know maybe something from somebody that's extinct or something like that but a bio signature i'll bet we find that and i'll bet we find it quick what do you think all right i like to think we'll find it quick i do i think that if we find something anything that's so intriguing it will help the search continue and i don't think it's too far of a stretch because if you get you get microbes going, you know, I mean, they can change the atmospheric makeup of a planet very quickly. Look at look at what we have here with the great oxygenation event. You know, they, they changed this world immensely just by producing oxygen and photosynthesis. So why not? Why not see that? You know, I mean, maybe we would see it everywhere. But there are other ones like the vegetative red edge where you see plant life, you know, plant cells become very reflective in, in infrared. Do you have, are we coming across anything with the instruments that are coming online that might see that? Probably not at this point, 
But I think a common theme in everything you've just said is that we want to be open to possibilities. That if we see something unusual in the data, that will will follow it up as a possible lead that might get us to finding a sign of life. You have also worked on a variant, your own variant, the Seeger equation, a variant of the Drake equation. Could you give us an overview? Sure. Well, I was inspired by the Drake equation to recast it in terms of the search for, as you have been saying, microbial life that might produce a gas that we could detect with our telescopes. And that's in contrast to the original Drake equation, which is written to illustrate the factors that go into assessing like the likelihood or illustrating the terms that are relevant for contact by aliens. And by the way, I met Frank Drake and I asked him if he minded. I had already done my version of his equation by then. And he said it was fine. He said it was fine. I guess the big question, or at least the core of that is Earth-like planets that are, you know, essentially analogs of Earth. How many of those can we expect to find? Uh, just best guess so far. Analogs of Earth? Well, there is this number floating around that one in five sun-like stars has something that's analogous to Earth. That's preliminary. You know, that means that there's a planet that's earth size that is receiving very, very approximately a similar energy as Earth does from the sun. Now, in astrobiology, we, we people say that word a lot, sun-like. Now, what is the range around a sun-like star? I mean, does this also include, for example, a orange dwarf, you know, or type M red dwarf? I mean, how, how wide is this, this definition of um, sun-like? It kind of goes down to the so-called orange stars. We have this weird, very archaic um, identifying system for stars or classification system, and we call them FGK stars. So stars a little hotter and bigger than the sun and stars a little cooler and smaller than our sun are included in sun-like. But this other class of stars you hit upon, M dwarf stars, those are different, very, very different. They're much smaller than our sun, typically half to even a tenth the size of our sun. They have flares, some of them constant flaring with emitting high energy particles that will hit the planet. And also, because they these red dwarf stars, they give off much less luminosity than a sun-like star. For a planet to receive the right amount of energy to have the right temperature for life, the planet has to be much closer to a red dwarf star than the equivalent temperature planet's distance to a sun-like star. And what this close distance means is that through tidal evolution, through tides, the planet eventually becomes what we call tidally locked. And just like the moon shows the same face to Earth at all times, because our moon is tidally locked to the Earth, the planet would show the same face to the M dwarf star at all times, meaning that one part of the planet is always in daytime and one part is always in nighttime. How does that affect the equation for life? Does that, I've, I've seen some illustrations of like an eyeball world where you have this twilight zone where it, of habitability on, on the planet itself, but maybe the dark side isn't so good and maybe the light side is terrible. Do you think that's sort of too simplistic of a view? Do you think there may be atmospheric dynamics and things that go on that actually make these habitable zones on these tidally locked worlds much larger than we might currently think? I think they're large. I think the habitable zone is quite large. And I only brought up the M dwarf star and the, the tightly locked worlds because I think it, it could be very different there. Like the way that the seasons are and the weather and everything like that will be so foreign to us. But I don't think it's detrimental to life in any way. You know, people have, I'm not sure where you are right now, but here in New England, in the Boston area, it's quite cold out actually. This morning was like nine degrees Fahrenheit. And you know how on the cold day, well, you open your front door and the warm air rushes in and the cold air rushes out. That's sort of my simple overview of the planet that's heated on one side. One side's always being heated, one side is not being heated. Is that that warm air wants to go where it's cold. And so the atmosphere will circulate. And I don't think the temperature or the day and night difference is going to harm life in any way or harm life's origin or evolution. Yeah, exactly. So you would expect circulation in the atmosphere. I should note that it, it is a balmy 18 degrees here. That's <laughs> Fahrenheit. So <laughs> then wel welcome to the Midwest. Right. <laughs> um, now, in this case, you, you, another factor comes in. Uh, it, when you start dealing with red dwarfs and orange dwarfs, you're dealing with stars that are very, very long lived and much, much more than the sun. You know, the sun is going to increase in luminosity and bake this world in not too distant future, hundreds of millions of years. But they live, you know, 
billions, trillions of years, I think, for red dwarfs, allowing for a lot more time for life to arise and develop. Now, do you think that these stars, do you think there are stars better than the sun out there for life? I don't think there's anything better or worse. I mean, our own sun will live for a total of, let's say, 10 billion years, which is still very long. It's not a trillion, but I think it's long enough. I don't really think there's one better than the other. Now, what about planets? Some people have have put forth maybe there might be a, a sweet spot for something like plate tectonics at, I think, 1.3 or Earth masses, I think, something like that, that might favor life. So I guess what I'm asking is, are the conditions that produced us, could there be conditions that it, where it's even easier? Well, it's that's a hard question. I mean, think of how easy it was here. As far back as we can tell, life life was here. We think life originated pretty early on. So I'm not sure if it can get any easier than what's here. But as for your other questions, like what's out there, a lot of it's not observationally accessible to us. So whether a planet has plate tectonics or not, or a magnetic field or not. But we like to just think that that sheer number of planets means that no matter how rare or common something is, that there will be life out there in many places. Well, and, and I mean, even ideas like the traditional habitable zone seem to be defeated by our own solar system because we look and we see liquid water oceans under ice shells. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we have Titan now that people are even considering might have life in its liquid, not water, but it's liquid methane and ethane lakes. Lakes. And then also, you know, there's slush underneath the surface of it as well. So you could have a, a dual situation of dual habitability where <laughs> you, can, you might find one kind of life, very low temperature life on the surface in those lakes. And then you, you know, drill deep down and you find liquid water. <laughs> so you Yeah, can... yeah. And there's, there's a new con there's another concept for exoplanets that, you know, there might be some planets that have hydrogen atmospheres, rocky planets that have outgassed hydrogen and been cold enough or massive enough to retain it or have a reservoir. And, you know, hydrogen is a nasty, potent greenhouse gas. And one idea is that an Earth with a, a massive, with a hydrogen atmosphere could be habitable way, way further away from its sun than our, its star than our Earth is from our sun. Wouldn't Earth have had a lot more hydrogen when life arose here? as far as atmospheric makeup? We did have, people do think that Earth had hydrogen, not fully, but maybe on the order of, I don't even know how much, a few percent or 10%, or some reports are even as high as 30%. So it wasn't that much. And for this greenhouse effect to kick in, the atmosphere has to be more massive than Earth's. So I left out those details. But yeah, we do think we had some hydrogen around in the past. And most importantly, very little oxygen. No, yeah, very little to no oxygen, right? which uh, later on would come to define life, but it wasn't there at the beginning, which makes you wonder, you know, let me ask you this, all right? The, the unknowns as far as life, is there, do you think it's possible that we will see a, an exoplanet atmosphere that might be very strange as far as geology could produce or, you know, just normal planetary science? but not like anything we have here as far as life goes. Do you think we could, do you think we'll see a head scratcher someday that maybe that's some sort of very different life producing that atmosphere? That's a tough one. It's so hard to know what we don't know and what the, the range of possibilities are. All I can say is that everyone just is thrilled about the James Webb Space Telescope and about getting to evaluate different rocky exoplanet atmospheres for the first time, just to see what's out there. So we can start making sense of it all. It's really exciting, though, isn't it? I mean, I, just as a science enthusiast and amateur astronomer for 30 some odd years, I just look at it. And I'm like, this is so much further down the road than it was when <laughs> when I was a teenager. You know, we are so much closer. And to think where we're going to go from here is amazing because we could just at any moment get just a complete mystery, something that just what could that be, you know? So let me ask you this. Where did you start? What initially brought you into astronomy? Well, it's that just awe of the night sky, the moon and the stars and the planets, and just wondering what is out there. When I was a child, my dad took me to a star party. If you're an amateur astronomer, then you probably know what that is. It's not where the Hollywood, you know, Hollywood stars gather, but it's where amateur astronomers, usually in an organization, um, bring their telescopes out and have a public event and invite the public to view through their telescopes. 
I just remember seeing the moon like, wow, just a whole world in, in and of itself. What did it for me was Saturn. <laughs> I remember uh, my parents bought me a 30 millimeter Tasco telescope back in the late 1980s. And I was mostly interested in microscopes, to be honest, at the time. But I was also interested in the night sky. But once I put that 30 millimeter telescope on Saturn and saw the rings and it was like, that looks just like the pictures, you know, it was it was a done deal. And here I am. Wow. And you were lucky it was in the right, a good configuration at that time where you could see the rings. It was. Well, you know, they went edge on a number of years later, but I could. I could see them very clearly and just like you can see them now. And um, I was just like amazed as I guess 10, 12 year old thinking I can see this with a tiny telescope, you know, and, and indeed you can see it in binoculars even. And people should do that. Always look at Saturn in your binoculars. And it's it's just one of those showstoppers and it stuck with me for life. Now, when James Webb gets launched after the long, long wait. Are you going to apply for time and what targets are you going to look at as far as um, exoplanets? Well, the proposals call for using the James Webb Space Telescope has already been out. And I want to say there were like a thousand proposals, not all on exoplanets, <laughs> submitted to use the James Webb because it takes time to evaluate the proposals and get ready. And so what I did was I put in a proposal to look at a, not an Earth-sized planet, but a, a larger planet. We call it a mini Neptune. It's amazing that the most common type of planet out there that we know about is a planet two to three times the size of Earth. And just for reference, Neptune is about four times the size of Earth. And these planets are so common, but we have no solar system counterpart. And we're not entirely sure how they formed and, and what they're made of. And so it's kind of a stepping stone to small planets because we want to be able to exercise the telescope and to use it to be able to get great data on an atmosphere. Now, in addition to that, um, I'm not sure if my proposal will be selected, of course, because there's a lot of competition, but there are several teams that have guaranteed time, teams that built instruments. And so they get time allocated to them in advance of general users who are competing for time. And it's public what planets that they have assigned their allocated time to already. So we already know a lot of the planets which will be observed by the James Webb, even before the this competitive um, process goes through. Now, what of a target like Proxima Centauri? There's, of course, two candidate planets there that really seem to be there, but it's close, and that should be easy to observe. Is that going to be among your, your first targets when you can get telescope time on any of these instruments to take a look at and try and characterize an atmosphere? Or is it just not a good candidate because of the red dwarf or, you know, something like that? Right, right. Good question. So Proxima Centauri is an amazing system. You know, it's our nearest star and there's an Earth mass planet there, but it doesn't transit the star. It doesn't go in front of the star as seen from our viewpoint. And right now, the James Webb, well, the James Webb Space Telescope can only observe atmospheres of, for these old, cool, you know, solar system kind of age systems. It can only study transiting planets. Because remember, if it's not transiting, we have to block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. However, Proxima Centauri and its planet can be observed by what we also talked about, not the James Webb, but the Giant Magellan Telescope or a large ground-based telescope with the right instrumentation can block out the starlight and see the planet directly. And Proxima would be an ideal candidate for that one. Now, when you can see it directly, you can get spectra, right? Right, you can get spectra. Whereas opposed to something like, I don't know, Kepler, where you just have these transits and it would be, I, I guess, very difficult to pick out just what the planetary atmosphere might look like just from a transit, right? Right, right. There's no information in just a plain transit as to what the atmosphere might look like. So when you look at these directly, you're gonna wanna look at closer star systems. So it would seem to me the the pathfinder for this would be TESS, right? Well, it's kind of complicated because TESS is the pathfinder in the sense that it's trying to find planets, stars with planets that are somewhat close to Earth so that we can use the TESS findings as kind of like a legacy catalog to follow up on. Now, is there any such instrument that we could construct or have constructed for radial velocity? I mean, could we search a large portion of the sky for that kind of evidence of an exoplanet? Like right now, radial velocity is still pushing to higher and higher precision to be able to find Earths, but they can't do the whole field, the whole, you know, big, 
fields of stars simultaneously. It's still very much a one star at a time effort. So essentially, we're almost we're not blind, but we we have blinders that are put on us by nature in order to even find exoplanet candidates. But once we find them, then situationally, they might be able to be observed and characterized as far as um, the atmospheres. And I want to what I'm. I want to point out here is that this is hard work. Really hard work. And I like how you separated it because in many cases, the finder telescope, the discovery telescope is different from the one, the telescope that can study the atmospheres. So you need multiple <laughs> instruments, which again, <laughs> as a scientist, with, with when you have to apply for telescope time and you have to get funding and you have to do all of these things just to even look, it's hard, but it isn't fruitless. You know, we've already found some you know, there's been a little bit of, of work done in characterizing planetary atmospheres, exoplanet atmospheres. So this is a very worthwhile thing because what happens when we find another Earth? Well, do you know what, what do you what do you mean by another Earth? Do you mean an Earth around a sun or do you mean something like Earth around a red dwarf star? Something that makes us go, that looks familiar, which we've actually already found. But, you know, the, something that just looks like here. And, you know, say we see oxygen in the atmosphere and we, we, we look for a twin of Earth. Now, what, what do you think that's going to be like? I mean, when we find that, which I bet we do, what do you think, how do you think everyone's going to react? Well, people are going to be thrilled. I mean, we want to know if there are copies of us out there. We want to know if there's a planet that, that is like ours. I think it won't be as obvious as we're we're talking about here. I think it will be. You know, it's so hard to find and the data is so noisy. It could be a bit like the phosphine situation. We could find a planet and say, okay, it kind of looks like it has oxygen. Maybe it has water vapor. So I'm not really sure how it will play out. Now as to the future, when we build even better instruments, is this going to clear up? I mean, say we build the starshade and we can take a look at, at planetary atmospheres that way from space. Is it in our future that we will have significantly better capability. Yes, it's in our future. If we can have enough funding, we can design capability to find what we're looking for. Don't forget that the James Webb Space Telescope was conceived of over 30 years ago before we knew about any exoplanets. And it's really a general purpose observatory. So it's incredible that we can even do the things we're talking about when it wasn't designed for observing atmospheres of small rocky worlds. So in general, if we know what we're looking for and we can design to that, it really increases our, you know, as long as nature put the planets out there, we'll be able to find them. I think that's not said enough that, you know, we need to remember that James Webb is a general purpose telescope. It's built to look at the universe and that's most of what it's going to do. Of course, it has some capabilities of, for looking for exoplanets and exoplanet atmospheres, but it's mostly going to be looking at astrophysical phenomena way out there, you know, and revealing clues about the rest of the universe. It is not a purpose-built instrument for this. If you could build a purpose-built James Webb telescope, specifically look, looking for exoplanets, what would you equip it with? Well, I wouldn't build the James Webb because, you know, the James Webb works with transiting exoplanet atmospheres and not all planets transit. They have to be fortuitously aligned so that their orbits are edge on from our viewpoint. I would definitely do starshade. I would do starshade with a, a big enough telescope so we can search enough sun-like stars and find the planets and we'll be able to look at their atmospheres. Now you do a lot of interviews in, in this field and I wanted to ask you, is there, is there something that nobody ever asks that you would like to discuss about um, astrobiology or exoplanets in general? Well, there is a tough one and the question is, what will it take to be sure that we have found signs of life. Or you can ask this a different way is what signals in terms of atmospheric gases would speak to you uh, to be certain that there's there's life there. That's one I got asked recently. I actually got that asked recently by a student in a, it was a winter school and it was a Q&A session and the student asked that question. So that that's the big question, ambiguity. And this is this. Yeah, well, you, you've just kind of given the answer. Yes. Ambiguity haunts everything in SETI because, you know, you can look at a radio signal and say, you know, like the wow signal, you can say, well, that looked really interesting, but <laughs> it was unambiguous or it was ambiguous rather. Now, well, I don't know. I mean, it depends. I actually think 
there's a chance for a study signal to be to not be ambiguous, to be certain. You know, if, if an alien civilization sends us an actual message, like a repeated pattern that's coming from one star, one direction, repeats, and the message somehow we can decipher, then it will be a sure thing. The question was more about the gases. Like for you, if you see oxygen and methane, will you be 100% sure there's life there? And that has still ambiguity. Yeah, because you have, of course, geologic processes that can produce it. Now, I agree with you that that a certain type of radio signal can only be technological. And if it's repeating that you can study it, then you've got it. But in the case of the biosignatures, it seems like it's going to be more ambiguous. But do you think that there's a very a clear marker, you know, that we could see and say that is a biosphere? Unquestionably. Do you think there's any type of gas configuration in an atmosphere that might yell that? You know, I go back and forth on that. But at the moment, no. No, 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 I can't think of one thing, like even in the context of the rest of its atmosphere, where we could be certain. But as a techno signature, the CFCs would be a certainty, right? Well, I just heard the other day, oddly enough, and I, I have to follow this up, so I'm not sure what the answer is, that there might be a way for some CFCs, but not all, to exist without being human made. Just what we needed, <laughs> natural CFCs. <laughs> Now, let me ask you this uh, sort of an off the wall question to end the discussion. If you saw an atmosphere around a planet that's Mars like, say it's exactly the same conditions as Mars and should have lost its atmosphere, but there it is with an oxygen atmosphere that it's holding on to, would that be unambiguous? And it would probably be artificial. Well, I've never, that's a great question. I've never heard that one asked before. That would be if we could tell that, if we could tell the planet size and mass, and we could tell the mass of the atmosphere. And if that didn't fit together, there'd be a definite possibility of, I think that's what you're meaning is terraforming. That's some intelligent species terraforming. Like that would be, I actually haven't heard that. And I love that idea. Well, I've thought about it where, okay, so you have a, an analog of the solar system where you have, say, say, say you were an alien scientist a million years in the future, and you're looking at the solar system and you say that second planet should be too hot, but it's not. And that third planet is okay, but that fourth planet is too small and shouldn't have an atmosphere that thick. You could infer that there are terraformers here from that, right? If you could put it all together, you could. But I've just heard this now, but I'm sure if we put this to a room full of planetary scientists, someone would come up with an ambiguity, <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, right now, though, I love this idea. I like the idea. Great, yeah. It's at least fun. It's at least fun. All right, Dr. Seeger, thank you for joining us, and I wish you good luck in your work, and I hope that we find something. Thank you. At least, at least, at least find a mystery. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science John, fiction author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. And be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What? <laughs>